Tonight on Now, as Irma weekends, people in the Caribbean want everyone to know their struggle is far from over. Jess Gagne speaks with a couple in Brunswick that was actually saved by someone famous. Yeah, a lot of people spent time over the weekend on social media, checking in with their friends and their family, making sure everybody's okay. Well, September 11th, 2001, social media wasn't what mm. it is today. We'll talk to a family that wish they could have communicated like that 16 years ago. Plus, gubernatorial candidate Ken Fredette is live in studio answering your questions. This is New Center Now. Coming in by the minute of the damage caused by Hurricane Irma, this is St. Martin. More than 1,200 Americans evacuated from this area. The U.S. military flew one woman to Puerto Rico after she rode out the storm in a stairwell and an elevator shaft at a hotel. Roofs are ripped off houses, shattered ports, debris scattered on land and offshore. This is what the U.S. Virgin Islands looked like. Hurricane Irma absolutely hammered the islands as a Category 5. Hello, everybody. I'm Lee Goldberg. And I'm Amanda Hill. While much of the attention surrounding Irma has been on Florida, the Virgin Islands may have seen the worst of it. Now, many Mainers were there when the hurricane hit, and guess who rescued some of them? Country music star Kenny Chesney. It's true. Bizarre, yeah. Jessica Gagne is here with that part of the story. That's right, you guys. Uh, Hurricane Irma hit the U.S. Virgin Islands of St. John and St. Thomas on Wednesday as a Category 5 storm with wind gusts up to 185 miles per hour. Mainers were there when it happened, and we spoke with several today, including a Brunswick family that lived through the nightmare and knows firsthand just how much the islands need help. We're watching the water come through every nook and cranny. The Bettingers were among 13 adults, four kids under four, and five dogs forced to seek shelter in a laundry room when Irma hit the U.S. Virgin Islands of St. Thomas and St. John. All of a sudden, my son looks up at us and just goes, He's like, Daddy, there's water coming. For four hours, this family and others held mattresses against the door and soaked up water with their shirts. When it was finally safe to come out, this is what they saw. It was just like, devastation, like just the island got flattened. The Bettingers live in an apartment on the side of country singer Kenny Chesney's St. John home. They felt they were as safe as they could possibly be in a Category 5 hurricane and still walked out to massive destruction. It was like that gut feeling of what does the rest of the island look like? How could they have possibly survived? Homes, restaurants, and businesses in shambles. They were told it could take months to restore power to the area. Tourist destinations, which the island thrives on, were annihilated. The worst part, the Bettingers say, was having no way to know if their friends and family members were safe. No cell phone service, nothing. You can't reach anyone because you can't drive anywhere, you can't get anywhere. Facebook groups like What's Going On St. John are helping to connect islanders with their loved ones on the mainland. Also on the page, endless calls for help and supplies. Food, water, propane, antibiotics. As the days pass without enough necessities like food and clean water, the friendly and kind island that this family calls home becomes a scarier place. It's the Wild West and it's people do what they need to do to survive and you don't know what that's going to take. Kenny Chesney sent manpower and a chopper full of supplies as soon as possible. That's when the Bettingers were offered a ride off the island. I had I had an amazing opportunity, to, to chance to, that I, I had to take for my kids to be able to leave, and that killed me because I want to be there with them. Neighbors they've known for the 15 years they've called the island home, trapped in the destruction with no idea how long it will take to get back to normal life. This is an island in the Caribbean, a U.S. territory where people are truly struggling and it's going to be a really long struggle. Yeah, they have a very long road ahead of them. Not that just that family. I also spoke with a family from Biddeford whose son is there, um, lives on St. John, just got off the island today, actually is on his way home. Um, and then other people from Old Orchard Beach who are still there who have seven people crowded into their apartment. Um, 
this family was just telling me how helpful this island is and how, how resilient they are and they know things are going to be better eventually but it is a very long road to get there so right. we posted a lot of links to ways you can help if you were interested in helping on our websites. Yeah, I mean, it's not like they have construction companies right there and all the supplies they need right gone, there. Yeah. yeah. And then they just need, I mean, basic necessities are on an island, a very small one. Right. So, it's wow. Tough. All right, thanks, Jess. Now, Irma had dropped down to a Category 4 hurricane by the time it hit the Florida Keys, but it's still packed devastating wind, heavy rain, and extreme storm surges. Many homes are destroyed there. The area is only accessible by air right now. Yeah, Miami felt the impact as well. Millions of homes and businesses without power in the Sunshine State right now, and it could be this way for weeks. Winds toppled cranes in Miami and Fort Lauderdale, and the heavy rain has flooded the streets. Irma slowed down a little bit and hit Tampa as a Category 2. This is video from the Port of Tampa looking back toward downtown. Several transformers blew up, causing major outages. 100 mile an hour winds and heavy rain added to the problems there. And people are dealing with Irma in northern Florida as well. The storm has caused flooding in Jacksonville. City officials say that people should not be on the roads. Some people are finding water so high that their parked vehicles are floating away. Now, the storm has weakened, but other states are dealing with it right now. Yeah, meteorologist Jess Conley joins us with what's left of Irma. Hey, Jess. Hey guys, yeah, unfortunately, uh, a lot of states still dealing with it with it right now, including uh, Georgia up to South Carolina. There's lots of flooding going on right now in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, there's actually a flash flood emergency uh, because there is so much flooding from that storm surge. What's happening is winds are blowing onshore. Uh, you can see that box around Charleston and all the way down to Savannah too. That's where they're dealing with flash flooding. And we have a tornado watch for many locations within that area too. So again, even though Irma is weakening, still a lot of impacts uh, in the southeast U.S. Irma now a tropical storm with winds of 50 miles an hour, still gusting though to 65 miles an hour. It's moving pretty quickly to the north northwest at around 17 miles an hour. You can see it here. Uh, also watching Jose in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, you can just barely start to see it. We'll talk about that more coming up in the full weather. Winds still gusting pretty strong right now around 38 miles an hour in Jacksonville, uh, 36 in Savannah, 40 in Charleston and up to 44 in Columbia, South Carolina. These are some of the biggest, uh, strongest, I should say, wind gusts reported from the storm. Look at that. Naples winds gusted to 142 miles an hour. Absolutely unbelievable. Marco Island winds gusted to 130 miles an hour. Uh, that's where Irma made its second landfall yesterday afternoon. You can go on down the line there. You can see Key West too. winds gusted to 91 miles an hour. So of course a pretty big storm unfortunately still affecting the southeastern United States. But now we're watching another one. Jose, we'll talk about that in the weather for our area coming up in a little bit. Lee. All right, Jess, thank you very much. With all of the hurricanes that have been happening lately, people have been flocking to social media to check on friends and family members to make sure they're okay and for people to check in. Well, those social media tools were not available on this date 16 years ago, September 11th, 2001. So we didn't know if he was with us or not. While the entire world watched and wondered what was happening, one family from Maine was wondering if their son was still alive. We just watched everything go down, the buildings collapsing, and we didn't know if our son was there or not. I thought he was gone. I cried hysterically, hysterical. Josh Messier, who graduated from Deering High School, was working in the North Tower when the first plane hit. At the time, the majority of cell phone towers in Manhattan were on top of the Twin Towers, so communication was almost impossible. But I remember uh, when I walked, when I got out of the tower and I, I realized the, what, had, what had actually happened, uh, I realized it was a lot more, more serious than anyone had thought and needed to get in touch with my parents and was extremely frustrated. It was impossible to get a hold of, of anyone, friends, family. Seconds turned into minutes, minutes turned into hours, and then after what felt like days, Josh was finally able to get in touch with his parents. Just crying. Just couldn't believe that he made it out. Especially after seeing all that devastation on television. It was incredible. The, the event was just so immense that you couldn't believe anyone would survive it. Not alone, your own son. My mom 
answer the phone, uh, hysterically crying, uh, obviously very emotional about everything that had happened, but just more importantly, just happy to hear my voice. Um, but it was, uh, you know, it was a, it was a long day of not being able to communicate with anyone, um, just because the, uh, the technology that exists today just wasn't wasn't there 16 years ago. Now Josh Massier lost a lot of his friends and colleagues in the North Tower that day. He still lives and works in New York. The Cumberland County Sheriff's Office is unveiling a piece of 9-11 history tonight, sitting just outside the jail. Sheriff Kevin Joyce was given a 100-pound piece of steel from one of the Twin Towers. It's now preserved in Portland for anyone to stop by and see. Gregory Ondo, an assistant professor of art at the University of Maine in Orono, donated part of the sculpture, the granite towers holding the steel in place. They are positioned to represent the actual towers when they were standing. Sheriff Joyce says it's important to not only honor the first responders lost, but to remember such an important piece of history for the entire nation. A lot of people 16 years ago today, went to work, never expecting the fact that they would not come home. Families sent their loved ones out to work, never expecting they wouldn't come home. And there were a lot of heroes, not just first responders, but you know, individuals that tried to help people out in that very devastating day. So this will be a, a way for us to walk by every day and not forget the folks that really made a big sacrifice and there are some families now living with that sacrifice on a day-to-day -day basis, and we can't forget that. That sculpture also has red and blue lights that will shine upon it at night. Tonight's public unveiling kicks off in about an hour, featuring the main public safety pipe and drum corps, which was formed after September 11th. All right, one of the most recent people to announce a run for governor in Maine is in our studio. If you are watching us on Facebook Live, leave a question for House GOP leader Ken Fredette. Next on Now, the Republican from Newport will answer your questions about how he would lead our state. All right, more people joining the race for Maine governor. One of the latest is House GOP leader Ken Fredette of Newport. He is here tonight to answer your questions about his candidacy. Thanks so much for coming in. Thanks, Amanda. So you started off mentioning that this is kind of a follow-up to Governor LePage. What does that mean for you? Well, what it really means is, as a lifelong resident of Maine, I, I remember the tough times, and particularly if you go back to 2010, and when we were in the Great Recession, unemployment was 8.5%. Um, the, the state had an unemployment rate of eight and a half percent. The state pension system was going broke. We owed the hospitals three quarters of a million, uh, billion dollars. We fixed all those things. We worked together with Democrats, with Governor LePage's leadership, and we're in a much better place today. And I think what we want to do is continue that growth uh, in going down the road, not seeing us move backwards. So I think that's that's why I'm really in the race. We had um, former DHHS Commissioner Mary Mayhew in studio a while back when she announced her run for mm -hmm. governor, um, and she talked a lot about the welfare reform. That's also something that you've been a big part of. It is. I, I've sponsored legislation. When I've gotten uh, legislation through with the governor and, and with the commissioner at the time uh, to make sure that we have people uh, that are really looking to work and not necessarily to welfare first and foremost, while at the same time protecting a, a safety net for those people that most need it. So the drug crisis has been a huge topic for us. Um, what do you think is the most important issue to tackle first? Well, I, I don't think that the legislature is, has really grappled with the issue of the drug crisis because I, I know that's affecting every, every business in this state, um, every family, and it's a tragic loss when, when anybody gets you know, addicted to drugs. And um, I think treatment is important, enforcement is important, uh, but I don't think that the legislature has really put the full uh, force of what we can do as a state into that, and I think it's something we need to work on. Um, we'll get there, but it's, it's really something that's over, overdue at this point. We do have a viewer question from Steve. Will you support the Convention of States movement? For people who don't necessarily understand what that is, first of all, can you explain that? Yeah, it's really all about li really limiting the, the ability of the federal government to keep just spending money that they don't have. I mean, as we know, federal government is trillions of dollars in debt, continues to spend more money than it takes in. And so the Convention of States is really a process to try to say, hey, let's get the federal government spending out of control. And so obviously as a Republican, where we have a, a balanced budget uh, requirement here in the state of Maine, we think the federal government could start to live by that same requirement. So, so I would do that, yes. That said, you have talked about reducing taxes, limiting spending. How do you move? How do you do that? Well, the, the fact is, we've done it three times. I mean, we've done three of the largest tax cuts in Maine over the last seven and a half years. And I think it's something that we are very proud of as Republicans. We need to continue to push that down, but at the same time, um, we've taken tens of thousands of people at, at the lower end of the income tax bracket completely off uh, the, the tax rolls, and at the same time, uh, making the earned income tax credit refundable 
uh, for the first time, rewarding those people at the lower end that are working. So we need to continue pushing that down so that we can continue to grow the main economy. All right. Gubernatorial candidate Ken Fredette, thanks so much for joining us live in studio, and he will stick around to answer more questions during the commercial break on Facebook Live. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Lee? All right, your forecast is next on now. As we take a break, though, people in Naples, Florida, are cleaning up after Irma. Wind gusts there topped out at 115 miles per hour. There's flooding and wind damage, but the city didn't see the massive 10 to 15 foot storm surge that many had feared. We're back with more after this. Irma is still losing steam, but still causing problems in places like South Carolina and Georgia. Yeah, a tree was blocking a highway in Georgia, but as our Chris Costa reports, Good Samaritans stepped in to take care of that issue. In pouring rain, a tree blocking I-16 westbound in Macon. And we got stuck. We are like the first ones that saw this tree come down. Mike Crate and his family evacuated from South Florida and were traveling back when he saw the mess with traffic starting to back up. The only thing we could do is move that tree. Using straps, Mike and two truckers snapped branches off one by one. Whatever we can do. All the crews are tied up trying to clear stuff. And you got, look down the line, see how much is backed up. We don't have much choice. Either sit in it or try to, try to make the best we can. With deadlines to meet, the truckers quickly helped clear the mess. So it's pretty amazing how everyone kind of got together. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, great Appreciate day. your help, yeah. Get us yeah. out of here. We're talking about Jose, actually. We're, we're like, into it. we're already moving on to the next with yeah. Jess. Yeah. We are going to start, uh, we're going to start by talking about our weather, right? We had a great day today. We got another one tomorrow. We should acknowledge that, yes. We should. We'll we should uh, talk about our <laughs> forecast first, right? Look at it today. Uh, high temperatures close to 80 degrees. Everyone I know wrapped up in kind of what's going on in the tropics, but we'll start with our weather. 79 for a high today in Bangor. Portland made it up to 78. Freiburg. You did it. You made it up to 80 degrees. It was nice out there today. It's a beautiful day. Temperatures still in the upper 70s, uh, close to 80 degrees. Now it looks pretty good all across the area. All right, uh, let's take a look at the satellite radar now. High pressure is in place. And when we have high pressure, right, that means nice clear skies across the area. That is certainly what we're seeing out there right now. Looks like this trend will continue as well as we go into the day tomorrow. It's looking good. Look at tomorrow morning. We're starting out close to 60 degrees. Plenty of sunshine for the day tomorrow, too. Look at our temperatures by tomorrow afternoon. Upper 70s and lower 80s yet again. So enjoy it while we have it, right? Hanging on to kind of the last bit of summer. Wednesday looks good, too. We'll start out in the upper 50s and lower 60s for the day. Top out near 80 degrees yet again for Wednesday. By Wednesday afternoon, we'll start to see a couple clouds, but that's about it for us. All right. Let's just kind of touch on Irma. We'll talk about it just a little bit more. You can see lots going on uh, along the southeast coast right now. Plenty of rain still. They're seeing tropical storm force winds in many locations, but I know this is what everyone kind of wants to hear about at this point. This is the next one. Hurricane Jose winds now sustained at 100 miles an hour, gusting as high as 120. It looks like what's going to happen with Jose. Let me show you this. This is one of the forecasts. Uh, these are many of the forecast models, I should say. It's kind of going to sit out in the Atlantic and kind of loop around for a few days, about three to five days. Then look at what these models do. They take it anywhere from going pretty much right out to sea. It could come up the East Coast. Remember, though, models for Irma were also thinking this and kind of look what happened with that. Or it could go back into Florida. We are talking about seven to eight days before any of this uh, stuff really happens, before it could even get close to the U.S. So best thing we can do uh, at this point is just kind of wait and see. Of course, we'll keep you updated as we go through the next couple of days as well. Here's a marine forecast for tomorrow. Seas around three feet, winds from the west at about five to ten knots. Could gust as high as 20, though, as we get into tomorrow afternoon. Look at our forecast for this week. Spectacular will be in the low 80s as we head into the rest of the week in inland spots. Uh, upper 70s, low 80s at the coast. Once we get into tomorrow, it looks great. Still staying nice and clear, increasing clouds by Wednesday afternoon. Uh, Thursday, we do have a chance for just a couple showers very early Thursday morning. A few late showers as we get into the day on Friday. You'll notice temperatures will finally start to cool down for the day on Friday as well. But it's looking pretty good all in all. Even the weekend still looks nice, low to mid 70s for highs with a mix of sun and clouds. So overall in our area, it's looking pretty good. Lee and Amanda?
too shabby. Take All right, that. thanks, it. Jess. Cindy Williams is here with a look at what's coming up in the next half hour. Yeah, hi guys. We have the latest on a trial um, that has been watched closely because a judge committed Leroy Smith III to the state psychiatric hospital tonight. Now, he killed his father in Gardner in 2014. He's the first person in Maine ever to be ordered to take his medication in order to become competent to stand trial, but that trial never actually happened. We'll tell you why. Plus, the cleanup after Hurricane Harvey continues. Christina Rex, as you know, is in Houston, and she has been there where there is a shelter with 500 animals oh. in it, and all these animals are just be waiting to be reunited with their oh. owners. But thank goodness they have a shelter for the animals yes. to go to, because yeah. so many didn't allow you to bring your animals with you. To yeah. check her carry-on luggage when she gets home. <laughs> yeah. there's, there's She's going to come gonna home with a few five yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Well, we're back. Your chance to vote on this week's Hometown Showdown. phone or get on your computer. It's time to vote for our hometown showdown game. And this week we put the spotlight on some of the bigger schools in the state. Here are the week three candidates from Class A. First, it's a rematch of last year's Class A state championship game. Bonnie Eagle beat the Portland Bulldogs to earn their sixth state title under coach Kevin Cooper. The Scots will take their 2-0 record to Fitzpatrick Stadium Friday night to face a Portland team looking to avenge that loss. Next, it's a battle of the undefeated. Thornton Academy has put up 101 points in just two games. Scarborough is not too far behind with 97 points. The two teams will meet in Red Storm territory to see who will keep their perfect record and who will put a tick in the loss column. Last but not least, Lewiston hasn't lost a game yet this season either. The Blue Devils took down Oxford Hills last week and will head to Wyndham Friday where the Eagles are looking to bounce back from a week two loss. There you have it. The voting is open. Click on Pulse in our mobile app or go to pulse.newcentermain.com and let us know which game should be this week's hometown showdown. All right, you like American Ninja Warrior? Love. Absolutely love it. love it. So a Waterville athlete will be in the national spotlight tonight because John Alexis Jr. will be on American Ninja Warrior right here on NBC. Yes, national finals continue in Las Vegas where top competitors will tackle a four-stage course Here's a little sneak peek. This is the hottest it's ever been in Las Vegas, and they're going to have to stay mentally sharp and focused while competing in this excruciating heat. I mean, 117 degrees, viva loca. Well, I think what's really heating it up is the talent they have and the unbelievable hosting that's always here. <laughs> Is obviously a piece of it. Rob Nesbitt caught up with John Alexis Jr. and Jesse Labreck as they trained together. This is some video of the workouts they did in that gym. American Ninja Warrior starts at 8 o'clock tonight right here on NBC. And, of course, we will be rooting for you, John. There are rooting a lot of gyms like that now that have kind of spawned ever since that show became really popular. Yeah. Where you can go in and train in that kind of stuff. So. I smell a story coming up for you and I, sir. Pretty cool. All right. News Center at 5.30.